The Last of Us launched in 2013 and was praised as being one of the greatest games ever made, gaining copious amounts of Game of the Year awards, praising the game for its incredible story and brutal gameplay. Before I get into this critique slash commentary, I do want to say that this game means a lot to me. This game is the sole reason I wanted to go to college and learn how to write, create, and produce deep stories that take on harsh realities and develop amazing characters. So yes, this review will be biased. I'm being honest with you. I don't want the comments saying I'm a PlayStation shill or that I'm extremely biased because, well, I, I know I'm biased. And since doing these kind of videos, this was the game I was most excited to play, and it seemed only fitting to wait until the remake was released. But with that being said, I am not reviewing the game through the lens of the remake because, well, you, you can't. The remake only elevates graphics and gives the game even more weighty combat, as well as adding DualSense support and 3D audio. If the remake is not going to change the narrative for combat, only elevating the things I mentioned, why wouldn't I play this version? It's not significantly changing anything. The game is essentially the same as its PS3 or PS4 version. But with that out of the way, let's get on with the video. Please like, subscribe, comment, and let's get started. We start out with a calm moment. We see a young girl, Sarah, resting on a couch, then suddenly we see someone walk into the house. We get introduced to Joel, the main character of the game. Sarah then wakes up, her dad sitting down next to her. A little conversation ensues, but Sarah pulls out a present for Joel. Apparently it's his birthday. She gives the present to him and he opens it up. It's a watch. Out of my experience, if you have no idea what to get for your dad as a present, a trusty watch is always a good go-to. But afterwards, Joel jokes around saying that the watch is stuck and of course Sarah falls for the joke. I love this part of the intro. It gives you an insight on how the relationship between the two is. Not to mention that there is a little foreshadowing in this scene. The watch ends up getting stuck later in the story and stays that way throughout. Not only is it stuck, but cracked and broken. It's not only really foreshadowing, but also shows how Joel is feeling during the game. I will elaborate on this further later on, but it's my favorite part. Sarah says that she got the money from selling hardcore drugs. I don't know. It, it was such an out of left field statement from what she just said. But I can't help but chuckle every time I hear it. Afterwards, a beautiful scene plays out where Joel takes his daughter to bed and tucks her in. With the beautiful soundtrack playing in the background before the scene cuts to black, Joel says a couple words. Good night, baby girl. Soon after, we hear the phone ringing and it wakes Sarah up. And I guess it's Tommy, who is Sarah's uncle, states that she needs to get Joel on the phone. Something bad is happening and afterwards the phone shuts off. I love this setup within the opening act of the game. It gives you beauty with the love of parenthood, but also quickly transitioned into mystery and horror that is about to ensue. The writing in this game is off to a great start and you can't help but want to know more about Joel's relationship with Sarah and about what exactly is happening. That got Tommy worried. Regardless, you get to explore Sarah's room. You can find Joel's birthday card that Sarah forgot to give him. You can find Sarah's personality all in here. And it's enough to give you a solid foundation on who exactly Sarah is. Her likes and wishes essentially. I will say in the remake, the amount of detail in this room is amazing. It's so amazing, in fact, that I really can't put it all into words. This is a piece of art within itself. I've never seen a more beautiful game and I wholeheartedly mean that. But regardless, once you make your way out of Sarah's room, you can go into multiple areas of the house to explore. I went to the bathroom and you can interact with a newspaper that says that there's a mysterious infection going around and it's causing hospital admittance to spike. Yikes, sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Anyways, once you explore the house a little more, you get to see one of the coolest interactions I've seen in a video game. You come across a news reporter outside of some burning building with commotion going on around her. Soon after, an explosion happens on the TV screen, but once you look to the left, you will actively see the explosion happen. I'll let the scene play out so you know what I'm talking about. Are you in here? Somehow connected to the nationwide Where the pandemic. heck are you? We've received reports that victims afflicted with the infection show signs of increased aggression. It's and nearby. Out of here now. There's a gas leak. Hey, there seems to be get some commotion here. coming from... Get the hell out of here, uh, what was that? Dad? Afterwards, Sarah, of course, gets scared. She doesn't know what is going on. So, of course, you go downstairs trying to look for Joel, her dad. Considering he's nowhere to be seen, I'd be freaked out. <laughs> I absolutely love this setup. So much suspense and anticipation for what is yet to come. When you're downstairs and go through the doors, Joel comes barreling in, seemingly rattled about something. He then asks us if we are okay. Sarah says yes, of course, but with a hesitation. She wants to know more about what's going on. 
Joel warns her not to go near the doors, which freaks out Sarah understandably. I love how they're making us play as Sarah, to be honest. I don't want to say it makes us feel helpless, but it helps us see the fear of someone that is close with Joel. And that carries on later in the story, which you will see soon. Joel warns us that their neighbors are sick and soon after shit hits the fan. The neighbor breaks into the home and now infected and charges Joel. He shoots him, of course, but you see the disbelief in his eyes. He didn't want to kill that man, which is important to point out. Joel later in the game isn't this innocent. Quite the opposite, actually. And I love this change in character over the story. You don't see this very often. The only time you do really is in PlayStation exclusives. And I'm not a shill, but you can't tell me I'm wrong. The characters make their way outside where they will meet Tommy. Joel's brother and Sarah's uncle. They get into the car and discuss the matter at hand, what exactly is going on. Tommy goes on about how a family essentially died, but Joel stops him because of Sarah overhearing. He cares for his daughter. Not to mention this will be important later when I talk about Ellie in the story. Soon we drive up to see what seems like a farm. This is entirely ablaze. Now I have no idea how this house caught on fire, but fucking Christ do the graphics look good. I know I said it before, but wow. I guarantee you that I will mention this a ton through this video. Once we get to the end of the line, we see an assload of cars that are backed up. Tommy comments on this and says everyone and their mother had the same idea. Not even a couple seconds after he says this, an infected person comes running out of the hospital and takes someone out of their car and mangles them. As Sarah, you see the horror of the infection. For some reason, seeing this through Sarah's eyes makes the scene a lot more horrifying. Maybe because she's a kid? An innocent child seeing all of this is just, fuck, dude. But regardless, after the trio sees this, they get out of there, back up, and drive off into the other direction. We eventually ran into a mob of people running from something, and after we go through them, we get run into by a fucking asshole. So now we're in the car trapped with Sarah's leg hurt. Probably the worst situation they could have been in, but once Joel breaks his way out of the car and picks up Sarah, we run for the nearest way out of the city. We get to what seems like a little bar with infected on a trail. Tommy closes the door and tells us to run for it and not worry about him, that he can outrun them. So of course we make our way out of the city, hoping that Tommy is close behind. And once we make it to a certain spot, a cutscene plays. Now this scene, yeah, I'm gonna let it play out. One of the most heartbreaking scenes I've ever experienced in the game. And after this scene plays out, we are introduced to The Last of Us. It's okay, baby. We're safe. We're safe. Hey, we need help. Stop! Please. No, it's my daughter. I think her leg is broken. Stop right there! Okay. We're not sick. We've got a couple of civilians on the outer perimeter. Please advise. Daddy, what about Uncle Tommy? We're gonna get you to safety and go back for him, okay? Sir, there's a little girl. But... Yes, sir. Somebody we've just been through hell. Okay, we just need... Oh, shit. Oh no. Sarah. Move your hands, baby. I know, baby, I know. God. Listen to me, I know this hurts. Baby. You're gonna be okay, baby. Stay with me. All right, I'm gonna pick you up. I know, baby, I know it hurts. Come on, baby, please. I know, baby, I know. Sarah. Baby. Don't do this to me, baby. Don't do this to me, baby. Come on. Beginning credits start to roll, giving you time to process what the actual fuck just happened. Initially during the process of making this game, these opening credits weren't here, which is kind of cool to hear. It was supposed to go directly into the game 20 years later when Joel wakes up. The reason they put this here was for the sole purpose of the player being able to breathe. 
to understand and process what happened so that you won't still be thinking about the scene down the line during important moments. I thought this decision was a good one. The break that I was given was just enough to put that scene in the back of my mind for later. Actually, a cool fact about this opening scene is that the fungus that is being shown was actually grown in Sony San Diego's studio bathroom. I don't know why, but I find this awesome and hilarious at the same time. It's like they said, fuck it. We don't have anywhere else to grow. Why don't just use the bathroom? It's also an introduction to the fireflies, but we'll get into that later. So not for the credits, we see Joel wake up from what seems like a nightmare. We also see that 20 years had passed, leaving much of his life a mystery up until this point. Most people probably didn't like this huge jump in time, but I don't mind it. Joel hears someone knocking on this door, and so of course he goes and opens it. A gal walks in named Tess. Tess pours a glass for herself, indicating to me at least she had a hard day, especially since she has cuts all over her face. Joel then pops the question of where she was. She explains essentially that they had a drop to make, but she didn't want to wake up Joel, so she went by herself. The deal she was talking about went well, and she pulled out some ration cards, saying that those will last them a while. Yet, she mentions that she got jumped by some assholes, specifically Robert's men. Now, Robert isn't important like at all in this story so you don't have to remember him he's only a pretext to the journey that her characters are about to go on but regardless joel and tess want to get revenge on robert and find out where exactly the guns that he stole now before anything i just want to say that the ambience in this game is amazing the amount of stuff happening at once is crazy especially the little dialogue interactions with npcs it makes the whole world feel lived in. There was this one instance where the guards were testing the civilians to see if they were infected or not. And at the very end of this altercation, one woman was infected and they just fucking put her to sleep. Not long after, they just pull out the blicky and shot a dude trying to run away. The detail is just crazy. We get to the checkpoint to enter the city and give the guard our IDs. Not long after, an explosion goes off, sending the quarantine zone into a frenzy leaving Joel and Tess to run away and find another route for Robert. A couple minutes pass as we enter the building and some NPCs tells us that we aren't the only one looking for for Robert. A woman named Marlene is looking for him as well. Marlene is also the head of the Fireflies, which means this isn't good news if they get in their way. What I really like about this game is the fact that a lot of cute and important moments don't happen during cutscenes. I mean, yes, of course, the cutscenes are important, but to me, the little things are what sets this game apart from the competition. Feel immersed and engaged when you're in control of your character during important dialogue sequences. Yes, I know some people think the complete opposite, and that's totally fine, but I find them part of Naughty Dog's charm. Regardless, soon after we make it to our little underground armory thing, I don't know what else to call it. This gives us our backpack, gun, and flashlight, the essentials. Minutes go past with casual conversations with Tess, some even optional with the triangle button hovering over top of their head. These certain moments are what I also love about this game. If you're invested enough with these characters, you'll want to press this button. After playing this game for a period of time, you'll find yourself just staring at certain characters, waiting for the prompt to come up because you care about them so much. These conversations reveal that Tess is hardened by the world that she's living in. She thinks of herself not a lady, which I find quite interesting in a very good way. I love it when games treat female characters as people who can handle things on their own and then some. Usually when games give a damsel in distress, I fucking roll my eyes because it usually means escort missions and I fucking hate escort missions. Soon after we get introduced to the infected, the ones we meet are called runners. They're the recently infected enemies, your traditional standard enemy when it comes to the infected. I will say the infected in the remake version are scary. I don't know if it's the updated graphics or the 3D audio in my headphones, but God, I got spooked so much in this game. We also get a tutorial on how to stealth and stealth kill enemies. This is traditional, nothing special about the tutorial, but I will say the death animations for NPCs and even the characters you control are amazing and gruesome. You can see the enemy's reaction to what's going on. You can see their struggle of getting out of of a chokehold or see them flinch when you sock them in the fucking face. <laughs> Now, to take a quick pause for a minute, in the middle of writing the script, I kind of realized that if I kept going into detail on every little thing in the game, the video would be like five hours. So now going forward, I'm going to focus on main story details, cutscenes usually, but when important dialogue options come up or moments in gameplay, I'll go over it briefly. And lastly, I'll talk about gameplay as a whole during the last part of the video. Hopefully doing this will limit the runtime to about an hour to an hour and a half. If it goes over that, I, I tried. But going back to the story, we meet a guy that was guarding the entryway, which leads to Robert's hideout. We bribe him with some ration cars to tell us where he is. The man is a snitch. 
So, of course, he tells us and points us to the direction we're supposed to go. This place is called the Wharf. Crazy how just one dude has a hideout as big as what we will see. Along the way to the Wharf, we just take out a lot of his men, no biggie. My question is, though, wouldn't someone have told Robert that we were looking for him by now? Or did anyone hear the number of gunshots that were fired? It's just beyond me. But regardless, we make our way to Robert after a long chase sequence. I want to let this cutscene play out because it's gruesome and it shows what little moral lines Joel has left across. Well, hello, Robert. <laughs> Tess, Joel. No hard feelings, right? None at all. All right. God damn it! We missed you. Look, whatever it is you heard, it ain't true, okay? I, I just want to say- The guns. You want to tell us where the guns are? Yeah, sure, but it's complicated. All right. hmm. Look, all right, just hear me out on this. I got- <laughs> Fuck. Stop, stop, stop! Ugh. Quit your squirming. You were saying? I sold him. Excuse me. I didn't have much of a choice. I owed someone. You owed us. I'd say you bet on the wrong horse. I just need more time. Just give me a week. You know, I might have done that if you hadn't tried to fucking kill me. Come on, it won't Who like has that. our guns? I can't. You can just give me a couple of things. <laughs> oh, <please. laughs> Who has our guns? It's the fireflies. I owe the fireflies. What? Look, they're basically all dead. We, we can just. Just go in there, finish them off, we get the guns. What do you say? Come on. Yeah, fuck those fireflies. Just go get them. That is a stupid idea. Well, now what? We go get our merchandise back. How? I don't know. We explain it to them. Look, let's... Let's go find a firefly. We won't have to look very far. There you go. Queen firefly. Why are you here? Business. You aren't looking so hot. Where's Robert? <laughs> I needed him alive. The guns he gave you? They weren't his to sell. I want them back. Doesn't work like that, Tess. The hell it doesn't. I paid for those guns. You want them back? You're gonna have to earn them. How many cards are we talking about? <laughs> I don't give a damn about ration cards. I need something smuggled out of the city. You do that, I'll give you your guns back, then some. How do we know you got them? Well, I hear the military's been wiping you guys out. You're right about that. I'll show you the weapons. Search the area. Yes, sir. I gotta move. What's it gonna be? I wanna see those guns. Follow me. Soon after we get done beating the living fucking shit out of Robert and killing him, Marlene, head of the Fireflies, shows up. Marlene looks like she's in pretty bad shape, and she asks where Robert is. Tess's badass just like moves out of the way and shows his dead body, and Marlene voices her displeasure and says that she needed him alive. But Tess fires back by saying that the guns that she gave him weren't his to sell, or he gave her. Sorry. Now I have to admit, the whole selling guns thing is kind of cliche. I mean, yeah, sure, it seems realistic given the circumstances of the world, but something just a tad bit more complicated would have suited this perfectly. I'm not saying that this MacGuffin doesn't work. I'm just simply saying it wasn't the best choice the writers could have made. But regardless, it's only a small nitpick. Just thought I'd throw the idea in there. Marlene then gives us a task. Tess and Joel need to smuggle something important out of the city. 
If they do this task, they will get their guns back and things on top of that. Seems legit. Guns and more shit. Who wouldn't want that? But Joel asked the important questions of where the fucking guns are. This is probably the most illogical question to ever ask in a situation like this. A lot of games would mostly like gloss over the detail and just have the main character believe whatever has been said. And this is why I like Joel so much. He's pessimistic. He's grounded. He's realistic. You never see these types of main characters in video games. See what I did there when I said grounded, you know, because it's a difficulty setting, but whatever. And I'll just move on. Regardless, we fight through some more enemies, specifically the military that was in the quarantine zone. It is unknown why the Fireflies are fighting the military at this point, but I don't think it's too important. But we finally get to our destination where Marlene shows us what we're smuggling. Marlene falls down in pain. So Joel bends up to, or bends up, bends down to try and help her up. And as soon as he does this, a little girl by the name of Ellie comes to try and stop him. Ellie then comes to try and help Marlene up, but Marlene dismisses her. And while Marlene and Ellie talk, you can clearly tell that Ellie is the thing that you will be smuggling. Joel even catches on to this and totally disregards this task and says that he won't do it. Marlene says that they only need to bring her to the Capitol building outside of the quarantine zone. Tess challenges Marlene and says that the trip isn't a close one. And I got to say, I love this back and forth between the characters. You could see the chemistry they have with one another. And it's something I've never seen in a video game before. Really only seen this kind of chemistry in like blockbuster films. Got to hand it to the actors. But regardless, Marlene tells Tess that she is more than capable to make the trip. Tess says that she won't smuggle anything unless she is shown where the weapons are. Once again, a logical. Marlene then confirms that she will show Tess the guns, but Ellie has to stay with Joel because she doesn't want Ellie in that part of town. I guess there's a lot of violence there. They never really elaborate on this, nor I don't think they need to, but I, I admit I'm a little curious. After Marlene says this, both Joel and Ellie disagree, stating that they don't want to do that. Ellie then pops the question on how Marlene even knows Joel, and she says that she knew Tommy. This is the first time we hear about Tommy since the opening sequence, confirming that he's potentially still alive. After the conversation ends between everyone, Ellie and Joel both go outside to find their way back to the safe house of some sort. I'm not sure the characters even mention where they're going. I only think they said that Joel should watch over her and that's it. But regardless, it's not important at all. I just thought it was odd that you had no idea where your objective is in the game. But once Ellie and Joel make it to their destination, a cutscene plays and it's so beautiful. I'm going to let this thing play out and go over it afterwards. I'm going to be doing this a lot through the critique, so brace yourself. Is it? What are you doing? Killing time. Well, what am I supposed to do? I am sure you will figure that out. Your watch is broken. <laughs> you mumble in your sleep. I hate bad dreams. Yeah, me too. You know, I've never been this close to the outside. Look how dark it is. Can't be any worse out there. Can it? What on earth do the fireflies want with you? Hey, sorry it took so long. Soldiers fucking everywhere. How's Merlene? She'll make it. I sell the merchandise. It's a lot. Want to do this? Yeah. Let's go. The most important interaction that I saw in the scene was when Joel sort of fake laughed when Ellie pointed out his broken watch. It was that laugh of ignoring what she just said while at the same time suppressing emotions. To add on to this, right after Joel wakes up, Joel sort of interrogates Ellie, asking what exactly the Fireflies want with her. Now, this was an interesting interaction. 
Joel puts on a front right away with Ellie, trying to block her presence in order not to get hurt again. Yet, he tries to get to know her by asking these questions. It's like he can't help himself. It's almost like Ellie reminds him of Sarah. It's almost second nature for him to try and be this dad figure. Maybe I'm too, I'm reading too much into this, but let me know. After the cutscene, Joel, Ellie, and Tess go outside the quarantine zone, beginning the journey of the game. Eventually, they get caught by the military, and the three characters all put their hands behind their head and get on their knees. For people that have never played the game before, this is an oh shit moment. I mean, they got caught. What the fuck do they do now? The military whips out their devices that show whether someone is infected and starts testing the three. The same device, if you remember at the beginning of the game, where that one chick just got put to sleep that I mentioned. Yeah, once that test hits Ellie, she takes out her knife and stabs the soldier. Joel and Tess take out the rest of the soldiers as well. After the whole fiasco, Joel looks at the device which reads, positive, indicating that Ellie is infected. We, uh, Joel, read this, and of course, he starts questioning Marlene's motives. He now distrusts Ellie, or at least is putting up a front about it. Tess isn't a fan of what happened either. But regardless, they don't have time to talk about it. They see a military vehicle coming towards them, so they dip. You'll notice throughout the game that they find something that will interrupt these heavy emotional moments. I will say that this is a fantastic tactic to use. It keeps you engaged in the game. It always has you on your toes. Something's always happening. And when there are the moments to breathe, you cherish those moments because there are so few of them. Yeah, sure. By the end of the game, you're going to have, you're going to be mentally fucking checked out and tired from all of the depressing stuff happening. But this is doubled down in the sequel. But in my personal opinion, those are the types of stories that I love. Maybe I'm just a sad piece of shit, but who knows? Afterwards, there's a huge shooting gallery slash stealth sequence that you have to go through. I personally like these a lot, where you have a choice on whether you want to go guns blazing or if you want to be a ninja and not be seen, you can go stealth. Now, I always do try to do the stealth approach, but ultimately fail every single time. During this section, you're also going to go through creepy, rundown buildings that will have you on the edge of your seat. And I'm not going to lie, I turned down my headset volume during these moments. I don't do well with horror. We finally get to the moment where there are no enemies around. Ellie takes a seat and tries to calm herself down while Joel and Tess make sure that they're safe. Tess then goes up to Ellie and asks what exactly the plan was after they delivered her to the Fireflies. Ellie explains that they have their own quarantine zone slash base where they have doctors that are still trying to find a cure. But my question is, how the fuck did they find these doctors and scientists? Did they just find them on the street and ask them to join the Fireflies? Although I think that this is incredibly unrealistic, I guess it makes sense also. I mean, everyone wants the infection to end, so of course there's gonna be a group of people actively trying to achieve the goal. It was said before that the Fireflies are literally getting wiped the fuck out. How would you even be remotely optimistic about the goal you're trying to reach? You have the infected on your ass, the military, bandits, not to mention people will be incredibly selfish given the circumstances of the world. People will most likely run off if it helps them. In the grand scheme of things, creating a cure would be impossible. But I guess the whole motto of the Fireflies is to never give up. So to summarize my tangent, it makes little sense as to why people are trying to make a cure, but in the end, you know for damn sure that's going to fail. This will tie into the ending of the game, so try and keep this fresh in your mind. Anyways, Ellie says that whatever happened to her is the key to finding a cure. Joel fires back by saying that he and Tess have heard this before, but it never turns out to be anything. He even voices his distrust of Marlene, but Ellie stands up for herself, saying that she didn't ask for any of these things to happen. You've got to admit, you feel bad for her. She's a little girl trying to deal with all of the depression in the world, and through the midst of it all, she is, of course, the key to solving everything. You already know that she has been through hell and back. The writers did an amazing job at giving the players a reason to care. After everything, Tess then pops the question of, what if? What if the girl is immune? This is a great question to ask at this point in the game. And at this point, you might as well say, fuck it. Let's see what happens. Tess says that they have gone this far already, might as well finish the job. Great point, honestly. <laughs> but after she says this, Joel reminds her of the horrors that are out there, the infected, other humans. Then the most important thing happens during this cutscene. I get it. The body language in this scene is so important. You can see that Ellie doesn't trust Joel because of the way he has treated her. But the most important thing that was shown here was when Tess looked back at Ellie and said, I get it. She understands why he doesn't want to go through any of it. 
She understands that Joel doesn't want to see Ellie get hurt, all because of what happened with Sarah. The scene was so beautiful, I can't explain it. After, there's a whole section stealth and shooting gallery that involves infected, especially the introduction of clickers. And clickers are like these weird, grotesque, mutated, infected that had fungus grow all over them. They're one of the older versions, uh, longer infected, I should say. And they make weird clicking noises because they echolocate they can't actually see anything, they're blind, which kind of ties into the gameplay and all of that. It's, it's cool and terrifying. But to reiterate what I said previously, we'll go into these kind of gameplay enemy sections toward the end of the video. So you're gonna find me repeating myself later on. That way it's just way more organized and blah, 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 blah. But regardless, after meeting loads of enemies and progressing further, we get to an old museum. Joel gets separated from Ellie and Tess because when they were trying to navigate the building, some of the structures collapsed, leaving Joel alone. And when Joel finally gets back to the two, you could see that Tess was struggling and Ellie needed saving. And of course, both of the problems were solved. Shortly after, Joel finds a wooden plank that can cross a gap from roof to roof. And of course, Ellie and Joel have a little moment between each other. Again, I'll let this cutscene play and I'll talk afterwards. All right. Now watch your step as you're going up because it's going to be a little... <laughs> Was that everything you hoped for? Jury's still out. But man, you can't deny that view. Come on, this way. Hey, let's pick it up. Look, we're almost done. We stay focused. Yes, ma'am. This scene is so beautiful. This is one of the first moments where Joel just lets go and tries to connect with Ellie. It's so perfectly timed, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to explain most of these cutscenes, to be honest, because they're so good. But after the moment that they have, Joel then looks down at the broken watch. Ellie very much reminds Joel of Sarah. At this moment, he remembers again to not get close, to put up that barrier. The hidden meaning behind these scenes is just perfectly told. This game is off to a great start to break up the moment and put you back into the goal at hand. Tess comes up from behind and tells us to hurry, that we're close. Her tone of voice immediately tells me that something is off, that she's clearly thinking about something, something not good. We finally got to the Capitol building and there was no good news. You see that the fireflies that were supposed to meet us there are all done for. When, De when Tess sees this, she freaks out, not being her normal self. And Joel tries to confront her and comfort her but it doesn't work. He asks how far they're gonna take this. After all, it was just for some guns and maybe some ration cards. It's not like they can make that back. Tess doesn't have any of it though. She tells them that they will take it as far as it needs to go. Afterwards, Joel's blow, Joel blows up on her, explaining that everything needs to stop. He says that they need to go back home, that they tried and they did what they could. Then the bad news, bad news comes. Tess says that this is her last stop and Joel questions her on what this means. Ellie pitches in and says a heartbreaking line. Holy shit, she's infected. And at this moment, when I first played the game, and even to this day, my heart shatters. Tess is such a great character. The chemistry between her and Joel is just amazing. But the world is harsh in this game. It doesn't apologize for anything. It literally says, fuck you, carry on. I know that sounds harsh, but it's, it's a compliment to this game. Too many games nowadays will take the easy way out and say, oh, by the way, this character's still alive. There's no consequences in there. We're just fucking with you. But in this game, they go full swing and put you on your back. Regardless, Joel is shocked and tells Tess to show him the bite. Of course she does, and it's horrifying. I swear these remastered graphics are just ridiculous. Tess eventually tells us to leave, that she will fight off the soldiers to give Ellie and Joel time. Joel, of course, takes time to contemplate this, but she intervenes and says that there's enough between them for him to feel an obligation to make it easy for her. After she says this, Ellie apologizes for causing all of this, but Joel says to get a move on. After the scene, you go through another shooting gallery fighting different soldiers. The heartbreaking part about all of this is that you can hear Tess's death once the soldiers break into the Capitol building. 
I'll let it play. It's good attention to detail. Upstairs. What do we got from there? Just keep pushing forward. Once you make it out of the Capitol building, you run towards the underground train. When Joel and Ellie make it to the entrance, they see a car drive at them with a machine gun shooting at them. And after this, you go through another shooting gallery, navigating the spore-ridden subway station, mostly through stealth. There was a part within this that solidifies Ellie's immunity towards the fungus. He's breathing in spores without a gas mask. Joel comments on this with Ellie replying with, I wasn't lying to you. And once the pair get out, Joel and Ellie finally talk after seeing Tessa's death, leaving the pair alone together. Ellie tries to talk to Joel about Tessa's death, but Joel interrupts her. He says that she shouldn't bring up Tessa at all and that she needs to do what she is told when she is told to do so. Joel also mentions that Ellie should never, under any circumstances, tell anyone about her condition. This scene really shows how much of an asshole Joel can be, but it's understandable. Joel lost his daughter. He doesn't want to get attached again just to get hurt, so he closes himself off. It's quite sad, to be honest. And after the conversation between them ends in a forced agreement, Joel says that he knows someone in a town not too far from where they are, Bill. When they finally get to the outskirts of Bill's town, Ellie comments on her surroundings. I found this very important to point out because it shows the little innocence she has left in this fucked up world. Let me play a little clip. Thing is just... I've never seen anything like this, that's all. You mean the woods? Yeah. Never walked in the woods. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Anyways, we go through the abandoned city trying to find Bill, and along the way, there are some important bonding moments between Joel and Ellie. They talk about the quarantine zones that had been going on around the world. They talk about Tommy, who used to be a firefly, which is why they need a car from Bill, hence why they're there in the first place. And one of my favorite scenes in this section of the game is when Ellie comes across an old arcade machine. Let me play it out. Oh, look at that. Would you play this before? No. I had a friend that knew everything about this game. Apparently, there's this character called Angel Knives who'd, uh, what was it? She'd punch a hole through your stomach before kicking your head off. <laughs> uh, I was never a big fan of these things. I wish I could play it. Yes, I know, this was such a non-important moment in the game, but that is what makes it special. In the grand scheme of things, it's not that important, but it reveals so much about Ellie's personality. It makes you realize that she is still a kid. She grew up in a fucked up world, but still finds a way to get joy out of things. I could learn a lesson or two from Ellie, to be honest. Going along further in the story, our first introduction to Bill isn't Bill. It's one of his traps. Joel opens a door and steps in a rope loop and gets swept upside down. Ellie tries to help free Joel by cutting the rope from the counterweight with her little fucking pocket knife and my god did it take a lifetime. Jesus Christ. <sighs> Regardless, after killing a bunch of infected coming at us, Ellie cuts down the rope finally and we get pushed down by an infected. Our good old friend Bill comes out of nowhere to help us, literally cuts off a head of an infected. But regardless, we run away from the infected the best we could and get somewhere safe. Then a cutscene plays. Bill makes his way to Ellie, who is trying to greet him. Keep in mind, while we were trying to find Bill, Joel explains that Bill isn't a people person. In fact, Bill is the only living human in this city. He's the most introverted of introverts. This means he doesn't take kindly to strangers. He's very paranoid. Bill walks up to Ellie and cuffs her to a pipe on the wall. Joel tries to stop him, but Bill points a gun at him and puts him on his knees. Pause. <laughs> Bill asks Joel if he is bitten. Joel insists that he's good, but after he says that, Ellie breaks free and tries to hit Bill with a metal pipe. The reason she does this is because she has a bite mark on her arm. She doesn't want Bill to find out. Bill then asks why the hell they're in his town. Joel tells Bill that he needs a car, that Bill owes him favors. Bill's sarcastic ass pretty much mocks Joel throughout the entire conversation, and Ellie does the same shit because she's a smart ass, and I love it. Eventually, Bill agrees to find a car battery to put in a car. Given that there is a car that still works, he says that there's a truck that had plowed into a school gym. That would be the best chance they have at fixing a car up and they finally go on their way. After sneaking their way past loads of infected, they get to one of Bill's safe houses that acts as an armory of sorts. An important cutscene plays, I'll let it play out. You don't touch anything. Can you close the door? <laughs> Let's gear up. Uh-uh. What? I need a gun. No, you don't. Joel, I can handle Myself. No. Just stay here. 
fine. Just wait around for you two to get me killed. Well, this goes on record as the worst fucking job you've ever taken. Hey, it's up there. How in the hell is Tess okay with this suicide mission? It's actually her idea. Really? Well, the broad's not as smart as I thought she was. But, fuck her. Seriously, you gotta take that kid back to where you found her. I can't just take her back. Then send her packing, let her find her own way. Look, let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, I had somebody that I cared about. A partner. Somebody I had to look after. And in this world, that sort of shit's good for one thing. Getting you killed. So you know what I did? I wise the fuck up. And I realized it's gotta be just me. Bill, it ain't, it ain't like that. It's bullshit. It is just like that. Hey! What'd I say to you when we walked down the steps? What'd I say? I'm just fixing your stupid pile. Don't touch. God damn it. You keep babysitting long, eventually it's gonna blow up in Bill, your face. Can we please just get on with it? Here. Let's get on with it. The reason I love this cutscene so much was because of the vulnerability with Bill. You can clearly tell in his eyes that he didn't mean what he said. He was only saying that to convince himself that he would be okay alone. He truly misses his partner. Not to mention the little moments he mentions Tess. Joel kind of dismisses those. To put all this together, Joel and Bill have essentially the same personality. Closing off, convincing themselves that not being attached to people is what keeps you alive. But forgetting the fact that those are the things that make us human. The parallels that this game makes are just so fucking good. The same scene also connects to the sequel as well. We will get to that in another video, of course. Other things I love about this scene is the conversations between Ellie and Bill. Ellie's such a brat and I love it. Flipping off Bill and shit, it just fits Ellie perfectly. Her extreme independence and her overall personality was a great choice in her character direction. But later on, you'll find out that there is more than what meets the eye with her. We will elaborate on that later. After fighting and sneaking out our way through hordes of infected, we finally got to the school. Along the way, we blow our stealth and a metric fuck ton of infected come after us. We run towards a window and make our way in. Ellie pulls Joel in and closes the window and barricades a door but lets us know that it isn't going to hold. Bill opens up the hood to the truck and gives us some bad news. The battery isn't in the fucking truck. Great. The infected then breaks through. Now it's time to get the fuck out of Dodge and find somewhere safe. After fighting our way through infected and escaping into a house, a cutscene plays. Bill and Joel start fighting about Tess since Bill brought her up. And of course, you would expect Joel to get heated about this. Suddenly, Bill stops arguing. Joel notices this and looks behind him. A man is hanging from the ceiling. He asks if Bill knows this guy or something, but Bill responds by saying that it was his partner. It was sad. When Bill starts talking, he chokes up, trying to hold back tears. You could tell that this person meant a lot to Bill, even though there was hostility between the two. According to Bill, his partner had bite marks all over him, and the reason that he offed himself was because he would rather take the easy way out over becoming one of the monsters. It's fair. I probably would have done the same. Afterwards, Bill turns cold, trying to convince himself that it doesn't matter, that his partner was an asshole anyway. Bill's always thinking very sadly. He thinks that if he doesn't care about anything but himself, he has a chance to live in this world. But when he does, he sacrifices what makes him human, like I mentioned previously. It's heartbreaking. Ellie then interrupts the conversation. You can hear her trying to turn the ignition, trying to start a car. Bill and Joel both ran to her. I guess Frank, Bill's partner, stole the battery from the truck at the school and had the same idea that Bill had. And Bill pops the idea of pushing the car down a hill and trying to start the ignition in order to get it running. Before we go any further, there's a part in the section where you can find a note that Frank left for Bill. Granted, the note isn't exactly kind, but you can find this note or give this note, I mean, to Bill. If you do give it to him, he will read it and talk to himself like he always does. He will then crunch up the note into a ball and throw it on the ground where he can pick it up back up again and read it and you can see it's all crumbled and stuff. This is such a little thing in the story but adds so much. It shows Bill's feelings towards Frank. Of course, Bill loves him, but since Bill is so prideful, he lets his barriers take over, making him still hostile towards Frank. Once Joel, Bill, and Ellie get the car running while Infected chase them, they finally get to a safe spot. Bill says that Ellie almost got them killed. It's surprising that Joel stood up for Ellie, of all things, saying that she held her own. And I love this. It shows the character growth. The bond between them is getting closer, and it feels so natural. 
the pacing you can't help but to applaud. Regardless, Bill gives us a gas siphon. He says that we would be surprised at how much gas is still in these broken down cars. Joel says that he is sorry for Bill's partner. Bill kind of dismisses this and asks Joel if they are square meaning if Bill's debt to Joel is paid off. Joel says yes, which prompts Bill to tell Joel to get the fuck out of his town, and Joel does so. Eventually, a cutscene plays out with Ellie and Joel driving in a car. It's such a wholesome scene, so I'm gonna let it play out. <laughs> I'm gonna do this a lot with a whole bunch of cutscenes. Hey, what happened to sleeping? <sighs> okay, I know it doesn't look like it, but this here is not a bad read. Only one problem, right there, to be continued. <sighs> I hate Cliff. Where did you get that? Uh, back at Bill's. I mean, all this stuff was just lying there. <sighs> what else did you get? Well, here. This make you all nostalgic? You know, that is actually before my time. <laughs> that is winter, though. Well, better than nothing. Oh, I'm sure your friend will be missing this tonight. Mm -hmm. Light on the reading, but it's got some interesting photos. Now, now Ellie, that ain't for kids. Whoa! How, how the hell would he even walk around with that thing? Get rid of that. Well, hold Just... your horses. I want to see what all the fuss is about. Oh, why are these all stuck together? Um... <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. Bye bye, dude. <laughs> you know what? This isn't that bad. Don't you try to get some sleep? Right. I'm not even tired. your seatbelt on, Ellie. Well, well, what about the guy? He ain't even hurt. The reason I love this cutscene so much is because of the growth of the relationship between Ellie and Joel. They joke around, and although Joel doesn't explicitly say he cares about Ellie, you could tell he does by the choice of words he uses. He wants her to get some sleep, he wants to listen to music with Ellie, those sorts of things. It was a great growth moment for the both of them, and it was executed perfectly. And soon after we get rid of all the bandits in the area, we open a garage door and come across a stack of bodies. Ellie comments on this, but Joel calms her down, saying that this could have been them if Joel didn't do do what he did. Ellie says that this is a lot of bodies. No shit, but regardless, we keep moving. Later on, we find another stack of bodies, but instead they were stacked on top of each other and burned. Joel dismisses Ellie and tells her to keep moving, and I like these little interactions. You get to see how much of the world spiraled downward. People just killing other people for the simple fact that they can. It's fucked up, like I said before. These people are sick, but this is what happens when the world comes to an end. Anarchy ensues only for the name of survival. Now, before we go on to the next cutscene, I just want to make a couple things clear. A lot of shit happens before this, such as little dialogue sequences that let you get closer to Ellie, among other things. When it comes to these instances, I'll cover them after the story section is over with. This is the same with combat and other things. I've said this before, but I'm just trying to reiterate it so you guys know. Let's just move on. Regardless, before the cutscene, you really only go through a huge-ass shooting gallery s stealth section thing. 
Joel and Ellie finally get to an elevator in order to get out of the hotel we've been stuck in for the past hour of the game. And I won't lie, this section is probably the slowest it gets within The Last of Us. I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but it's not as exciting as the rest of the game. But once we shimmy our way to the top of the elevator, we end up falling because our fat ass is too heavy. <laughs> and at this point, it's probably the most suspenseful and scariest part of the game. Everything ramps up. You have to walk around in the dark, find a key in order to open a door, start a generator so you can even access that door. And once you start the generator, loud noises will play. So infected are to come out, including stalkers, clickers, bloaters, whatever you can think of, just stands in your way. And I'll elaborate more on those enemies later. When we fucking put the shit out of that basement and piss our pants along the way, we make it topside. We fight a bandit who, bandits, I mean, who are patrolling, find a ladder, climb up it. And when we do so, a bandit rocks our shit and Joel falls down. He lands in a deep puddle. He struggles to try and get up, but he gets rocked again. The man on top of him tries to drown him. When he tries to fight for a gun not too far from him, someone shoots the bandit on top of him. And I'll let the rest of the cutscene play. <laughs> I shot the hell out of that guy, huh? Yeah, you sure did. I feel sick. And you just hang back like I told you to. Well, you're glad I didn't, right? I'm glad I didn't get my head blown off by a goddamn kid. You know what? No. How about, hey, Ellie, I, I know it wasn't easy, but it was either him or me. Thanks for saving my ass. You got anything like that for me, Joel? We gotta get going. Lead the way. The main takeaway from this cutscene is Joel is a fucking moron. I'm only joking, kind of. The reason is because he's a fucking ass. He's trying his hardest to distance himself from Ellie. He's scared that of that attachment of Ellie ending up like Sarah, which is understandable, like I've always said, but I can't help but feel sorry for Ellie. What the fuck, Joel? Like, that's all I think of in my head. She just saved your life. It was literally either him or you. Be thankful that you didn't die. After the fact, when you try to converse with Ellie or watch her actions while exploring, you can see that she is distant, reflecting on what just happened. This is an incredible attention to detail. The immersion by implementing this is so fucking good. Like, if my ass got yelled at like this, of course I'm going to be salty and distant. Why would I want anything to do with someone when they aren't grateful that I saved their fucking life? Anyways, Joel and Ellie going to move on. When we get topside, Ellie and Joel pause for a moment, overlooking a large shooting area filled with enemies. I'm also going to let this cutscene play out, considering its importance to the overall story and the gain trust between Ellie and Joel. Oh, shit. Come here. Get me head down. Right now, I'm gonna jump down there and I'm gonna clear us a path. What about me? Stay here. This is so stupid. We'd have more of a fucking chance if you let me help. I am. And you seem to know your way around a gun. You reckon you can handle that? Well, I sort of shot a rifle before, but it was at rats. Rats? With BBs. Well, it's the same basic concept. Lift it up. All right, now, you're going to lean right into that stock because it is going to kick a hell of a lot more than any baby rifle. Okay. Uh, go ahead and pull the bolt back. Grab it right there. Just tug it. Here you go. And as soon as you fire, you're going to want to get another round in there quick. Listen to me. If I get into trouble down there, you make every shot count. Yeah. I got this. All right. And just so we're clear about back there, it was either him or me. You're welcome. In a nutshell, Joel recognizes his mistake of getting angry at Ellie. He admits that it was either himself or the other dude. Character growth going on in this section is just great. It is one step closer to breaking down that barrier that Joel puts up. He's actively trying to be a better person to her, which is commendable. 
Also, giving Ellie a rifle is probably the best thing he's ever done, considering Ellie domes people, acting like she bought the new Call of Duty and trying to up her KD. She's a goat on the sticks, I swear. Afterwards, Ellie literally ends every dude in existence in the area. Joel goes down to a, a down bandit, picks up his pistol, and gives it to Ellie, signaling the gain trust he has for her. He then tells her it's for emergencies only. This connects with gameplay as well. Having Ellie equipped with a pistol is a lifesaver if you're on higher difficulties. She'll save your ass so many times I can't even count. I love it when games make female characters badasses that don't need hand-holding. One, because of diversity and inclusion, but also gameplay-wise. I hate trying to escort the damsel in distress and failing the mission over and over again because they can't defend themselves. Not only does having Ellie be able to defend herself make the game more enjoyable, but it also makes it more realistic. Like who wouldn't have a gun in the apocalypse? Afterwards, there's a whole ass section where you try to avoid a Humvee with a machine gun on it. My question is how in the hell did they even find that kind of ammo in the apocalypse? Like they go through it like nothing. I understand that this is a game and you shouldn't take this stuff seriously, but still you can't help but wonder. Joel and Ellie continue to hide from this fucking tank car by shimmying along a building a couple stories up. When they get inside, they get greeted by a dude. Greet is a nicer word for what actually transpired. Essentially the dude attacks Joel, but since Joel has plot armor, he punches the dude over and over again, beating the ever-living shit out of the dude. Oh my god. Joel gets stopped by Ellie telling him to look. Joel looks in front of him to find a kid holding a blicky aiming right at him. At that moment, Joel knew that he wasn't dealing with bandits. These were just people trying to survive. After some talking, we find out that the people are Henry, the older dude, and Sam, the younger one. They're both brothers. They hit it off and make their way to the safe house that Henry and Sam mentioned. Along the way, we find out that Sam and Ellie hit it off right away, which is very cute to say the least. In this world where everything is chaos, you need to find something calm to get everything back to normal. So when Ellie and Sam connect, it just makes you happy to see these two kids happy for once. They're acting like kids finally. One of the sadder moments though is when Henry told Sam he couldn't keep a toy in his backpack. I'll let the interaction play out because I think it's important. What is it? We only take what we have to. That's right. Now, come on. How far is this place? We're close. Real close. Immediately after you see the two be kids again, they are reminded that you can't afford to be a kid anymore. You have to be prepared. After the interaction takes place, if you look back to see what Ellie is doing, she stands over the dropped toy. If you look away for just a second and then look back, she will pick up the toy for Sam and stash it in her backpack. A sweet and appreciative level of detail that adds to the game greatly. You'll see why later. You finally get to the safe house after battling some bandits and sneaking around. Sam tells Ellie that they have been held up in the house for about a couple days. Sam invites Ellie to eat some food with him, blueberries to be precise. I don't know about any of you guys, but blueberries are fucking dank. Joel then talks to Henry. Henry tells Joel that he's waiting on an opportunity to escape the city. He goes over the plan, explaining that there's a skeleton crew guarding the bridge at night. It will go at the right opportunity, having the best chance of success. And since Joel's with them, why not now? Henry also says that he's looking for the fireflies, same as Ellie and Joel, meaning they have a common interest, indicating that they can stick together for the rest of the way. And it's nice we have some new friends. Joel then gets some rest for the plan that has been set. Ellie wakes him up, saying that's time to go. And of course, he does so. Along the way, we come across some enemies, and we of course take them out before we get to the checkpoint, but my ass sucks at stealth, so it was more like a shootout. When we finally get past the checkpoint, Bandit starts shooting at the gang, which prompts us to start running towards the end of the bridge. As soon as we got there, we hurried to try and get Sam and Henry on top of some storage container, and once we do so, we see the same fucking car with the machine gun that has been hounding us this entire section. Seeing this prompts Henry to take Sam and leave us for dead, and at this point, I was saying fuck Henry at my TV. I was so pissed at the fact that he didn't even try to help us. I mean, I guess he did help Ellie up when it came to us though, he said hell nah and dipped. Ellie jumps down and says that she will always stick with us no matter what. Now this got me emotional for some reason. For one, because throughout this game, Joel and Ellie have butted heads, but we still stick to each other, which is heartwarming. And second, it solidifies the bond that they have, the growth that these characters have gone through. Chef's kiss.
After Joel and Ellie battle some more bandits and run away from the armored car, they get to a dead end at the bridge. The bridge is literally destroyed, and the only way to escape the car is to jump into the water. Keep in mind, Ellie can't swim. She takes a leap of faith and just yeets herself off the bridge. Joel goes after her, and they both escape, but along the way of the rapid water, they hit a rock, and they both get knocked out. Afterwards, Joel wakes up on some sort of beach. He wakes up to Ellie looking over top of him, and right beside her is Sam. Ellie helps us up, but Joel isn't happy. I mean, neither would I. Fucking Henry left us for dead. Henry comes out of nowhere laughing and tells us that he told us that we would make it. Joel has none of it, though. He shoves Henry to the ground and points a gun at him, almost ready to pull the trigger. Henry then goes on to say that we were only pissed and that we wouldn't kill him. In all honesty... I believe Henry. If Joel were in this position, would he have done the same? Later on in the cutscene, Henry asks this exact same thing, which Joel contemplates. Joel eventually lowers his gun in agreeance to what Henry said, and the gang just takes different paths to try and find a way out of where they currently are. Along the way, Ellie and Joel have some bonding moments, talking about how this was Ellie's first time ever on a boat, which Joel responds by saying it's a little different than actually being on a boat in the water. Just some wholesome moments between the two. Eventually, the gang finds their way into the sewer system through a drain pipe. During this whole section, I was honestly a little scared. This was because this whole time it's like dark as fuck and you have to put your flashlight on at all times. And not to mention there's infected literally everywhere. Clickers, stalkers, and runners alike. Throughout this whole sewer sequence, nothing really crazy happens until the end. There's a point where the group gets separated where Joel and Sam are together along with Henry and Ellie together. But you really only fight infected and eventually everyone is reunited. The interesting part happens at the end, like I mentioned. A fuckload of infected start chasing after the group. They make it to this weird office area where there's a shitload of ammo and supplies, which means that you will need to hold your ground until Ellie and Sam can open up the door on the other side. Of course, the group makes it out alive and the cutscene plays. There's a message on the wall beside the door that reads, do not enter, infected inside. Fucking great. Could have warned us on the other side. Off in the distance, Joel and Henry see the tower that they're trying to get it to in order to meet up with the fireflies, so they go on their way. When we explore for some supplies, this is a cute moment between Ellie and Sam that I would like to show, so let me play it. It's pretty intense back there, huh? Oh, yeah. Totally. How did you two end up together? Oh, I... A friend of mine, Marlene, asked him to take me to the Fireflies. You seem to get along well. Yeah, well, now I just boss him around. <laughs> Isn't that right, Joel? This moment was so cute, and I don't know why. At this moment, you can really see how much Ellie cares for Joel. They have gone all this way together. She relies on him. It's almost like a father-daughter bond that they have formed. Though, I do wish Joel would have responded in some sort of way, whether that just be a grunt or full-blown sentence. Nonetheless, we get to move on. We get to this large open area with houses all around, and once we jump and hit the ground, a sniper starts shooting at us. This brings us to another shooting gallery and stealth segment. Pretty much all we do is take down some bandits, move around to the outside so the sniper doesn't hit us, and eventually we get to the sniper and take him down. After we do so, we actually man the sniper to overlook the crew, and when we do this, a little sequence ensues where bandits literally come out of nowhere, so you have to cover the homies with said sniper rifle, and I won't lie, the section was pretty fun, just beaming kids with this thing was satisfying. And afterwards, the Humvee with the machine gun comes out, and I guess they followed you all the way outside the city. This part I don't understand, why on earth would they follow you? And, and second, how do they even know where you are? Maybe the people you killed previously radioed in and told everyone. Maybe you left a trail, so they followed you. I have no idea. This doesn't seem very realistic to me. It was the only part of the game where I was tilting my head in confusion. After you take out said Humvee, the infected start coming out since so much noise was made. And when the infected do come out, they get on top of Sam. Of course, you shoot the infected off of him and everything is fine. So we think. After everything is done with, a cutscene plays. This scene is super important not only for the mental of Joel and Ellie, but also because it's extremely heartbreaking and it shows the nature of the world and how harsh it is. <laughs> Shut the hell up. Dead serious. It was Tommy's birthday and that's all he wanted to do is just Rent two Harleys and drive cross country. Oh, man. I could die happy if I could just ride one around the block. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like? It was good. It was real good. Good? 
Can, can you believe this guy? Come on, man, give me details. Describe it. <laughs> you know what? You two deserve a little privacy. No, no, Ellie, Ellie. This isn't just any regular motorcycle, okay? You get on that bad boy, you feel that engine? Nothing like it. Oh, yeah, how would you know? Seen it in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think anyone from my group is gonna show up. Yeah. Worst part about it all, explaining it to Sam. Well, it's safe to say those two have officially bonded. What are you doing? Taking stock of all the food we found today. I see. And how are we doing on canned peaches? Did Henry send you? No. Why would Henry send me? To make sure I'm not fucking up somehow. I'd say we all did pretty good back there. Especially you. Is everything all right? Everything's fine. Okay. Well, have a good night. How is it that you're never scared? Who says that I'm not? You scared up? Uh, let's see. Scorpions are pretty creepy. Uh, being by myself. I'm scared of ending up alone. What about you? Those things out there. What if the people are still inside? What if they're trapped in there without any control of their body? Scared of that happening to me. Okay. First of all, we're a team now. Okay, we're gonna help each other out. And second, they might still look like people, but that person is not in there anymore. Henry says that they've moved on, that they're with their families, like in heaven. Do you think that's true? I go back and forth. I mean, I'd like to believe it. But you don't. I guess not. Yeah, me neither. Oh, all the serious talk, I almost forgot. There, if he doesn't know, but he can't take it away. All right, I'm pooped. I'll see you tomorrow. That smells good. Good morning. Where's Sam? I let him sleep in for once. Oh. Well, if you want him to join us, you can go wake his ass up. Okay. Sam? <laughs> Sam! What the hell? <laughs> Shit, he's turning! <laughs> That's my fucking brother! <laughs> Screw it! <laughs> Shit! Really? Ellie, are you alright? Uh -huh. Oh my god. Sam? Oh no. Sam? 
Henry? <gasps> Henry, stay there. Henry? Uh, what have you done? <laughs> I'm gonna get that gun from me, okay? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, easy. Is this your fault? This is nobody's fault, Henry. It's all your fault! Henry! Henry, no! <laughs> The tragedy of Sam and Henry was a dark one. When I first saw this scene, I really had no way to understand what just happened. It just shows how unforgiving this world is. Something as little as getting tackled by an infected can result in catastrophic events to unfold. Loved Sam and Henry, but this game has consequences which is a good thing in terms of story. I'm also glad that the game lets you dwell on the previous scene for a moment, taking in the scenery of the Midwest, trying to cope with the loss of someone you got close to. It's heartbreaking. Now, to just take a little break, I will say that Melgado decided to say fuck you and stop recording halfway through my session without me knowing. So from now on until the end of the story section, we're really gonna breeze by this, focusing on cutscenes mostly. I wish it were different, but this is what I get for buying an Elgato instead of an Avermedia. So you're going to see bits of my gameplay and someone else's gameplay on YouTube. And of course, I'm going to credit them. So just keep an eye out. To move forward, we found our way to Tommy's place. Well, I guess it, is, it isn't exactly his place. We're at a dam that powers his place with electricity. Joel tries to open the door to go inside, but is stopped by a woman who's pointing a rifle at him. This causes Ellie and Joel to step back and lay down their arms. And as soon as they do this, though, we hear good old Tommy's voice. He steps out, greets Joel with a hug, and he introduces us to the woman that was pointing a gun at him, Tommy's wife. Maria. Tommy invites us inside and Maria offers Ellie some food and of course she accepts and we make our way in. After exploring the compound for a bit, we make our way inside. Maria gets a call to help fix some stuff, but she doesn't want to, so Tommy does it anyway. Ellie stays with Maria while Joel and Tommy go on their way. A little farther into the section, Tommy tells us he has something for us since he stopped by Austin, which was where the first part of the game took place. We see a picture of Sarah and Joel. Joel says, he's good and doesn't want the picture. Instead, he wants to talk one-on-one -on -one with Tommy. Heartbreaking. He's closing himself off again. He doesn't even want to think about his daughter that passed. After, when they meet, Joel explains to Tommy why he's on the adventure of his. Of course, Joel explains the whole situation. Tommy bites on this hesitantly, though. Joel explains that he wants Tommy to do the work essentially. He asked this because Tommy used to be a firefly. They get into a, a brief argument because Tommy explains he has a family and he can't risk his life for Joel's doing. They eventually get interrupted because some bandits take over the dam, I guess. I'm not sure why they would try to take this over, but nonetheless, we take them on. After we take them all out, Joel and Tommy meet up with Ellie and Maria. Ellie comes to Joel and explains the whole situation. Tommy looks over and sees the conversation that they're having, and you can obviously see the connection that Joel and Ellie have. He cares for her, which is exactly why he wants Tommy to take her to the rest of the way. Tommy recognizes this, which is why he changes his mind and agrees to take Ellie. Of course, you can imagine that Maria wasn't happy by this, which you can see in the next cutscene. Ellie goes up to Joel and asks what all the fuss is about. Joel dismisses her and Ellie has none of this. She walks away. Can't help but to agree with Ellie here. Y'all went across the country together and you just want to pawn her off to someone else? Joel is literally the only person she trusts in the world. Joel doing this hurt her even though she doesn't show it really. After the argument that Maria had with Tommy, she goes up to Joel and pretty much warns him that if he doesn't come back, that all of this will be on Joel. Agreed. <laughs> Tommy then gets a call saying that Ellie had run off with one of their horses and now they have to go find her. After going through a ton of enemies on the way to find Ellie, which makes little sense, why would they all just be chilling there and let Ellie run through them without, you know, shooting? It's, it's a little nitpick, but nonetheless, one of the most important heartbreaking scenes plays. Is this really all they had to worry about? Boys, movies, deciding which shirt goes with which skirt. It's bizarre. Get up, we're leaving. Come on. And if I say no? Do you even realize what your life means? Huh? Running off like that, putting yourself at risk? It's pretty goddamn stupid. Well, I guess we're both disappointed with each other then. What do you want from me? Admit that you wanted to get rid of me the whole time. Tommy knows this area. Oh, better fuck than... that. Well, I'm sorry. I trust him better than I trust myself. Stop with the bullshit. What are you so afraid of? That I'm going to end up like Sam? I can't get infected. I can take care of myself. How many close calls have we had? Well, we seem to be doing all right so far. And now you'll be doing even better with Tommy. 
not her, you know. What? Maria told me about Sarah. Ellie? And... You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. Sure as hell ain't your dad. And we are going our separate ways. Get it together. We're not alone. We got two walking. There's more inside already. Just Joel saying, You sure as hell ain't my daughter, broke me. After everything that they have been through, and that's what he says? Joel's prideful nature just shocks me after this long adventure, even though I totally understand why. It really is something that you can't explain. I applaud the writers on this one. It's just gut-wrenching, and I've never experienced a cutscene like this from a video game in my life. The acting? Phenomenal. After playing this game for the critique, I seriously have nothing bad to say so far. Once they get on their horses and make their way back to Jackson, you see the gate of the town. The set pieces, wow. In the remake, they really blew this out of the park, straight up. Joel contemplates things for a couple seconds and asks Ellie to give her horse back to Tommy. He tells Tommy that he changes his mind, that his wife scares him, that he will do the journey instead. This made me feel so warm inside. Ellie gets on Joel's horse. Joel then asks where the lab is where the fireflies resided. He explains that it's in, an, it's in a university in Colorado, a building that you can't miss. After the conversation, Tommy says that he will always have a place in Jackson. Joel nods his head and says his goodbye, and the two make their way. We finally make it to good old Colorado, making our way towards the building that Tommy told us about, and along the way we explore, talk to Ellie about the fireflies, and overall, just bond with each other. Along the way we come to realize that this place is way too quiet for supposedly having fireflies occupying it, which makes us think, are they really here? After taking out some infected as usual, we come across some wild monkeys that are just running free. Everything is odd around here and I like it. The game lets you think to yourself about what actually happened here before giving you the answer. Suspense is something you for sure need to nail in this game and they did it. We get to a cutscene that is important. Joel and Ellie find a dead firefly just sitting in a chair. Joel picks up a recorder and the firefly tells us that the fireflies that were occupying the place are all dead or they scattered. After hearing this, Joel fast forwards the recording to find out where the fireflies are now. He tells us that they're at a hospital in Salt Lake City, not exactly co close to where they are, but shortly after Joel gets interrupted after he sees a lone stranger with a flashlight shoot at him, indicating that they aren't alone and there may be more. This brings us to another shooting gallery stealth section. Nothing too special happens here besides using some badass weapons we picked up along the way. The important stuff happens when we get to a scripted sequence. Some dude comes barreling out and knocks Joel back against the glass railing. And after fighting, Joel punches the dude, which breaks the glass because of the way they moved, I guess? Hurling Joel and the other dude off the railing, Joel gets impaled by a metal beam, fucking ow, and he bleeds out. This is bad. And at this moment, I was so worried that Joel was going to die. We have spent so much time together and to have him die here would have been worrisome. For the game, since I don't think this would have been a good time for him to die, but Ellie comes to the rescue and gets him off the metal beam and carries him towards our horse, Callus, that has been waiting for us. I'll let this cutscene play out because it shows the care that Ellie has for Joel. <laughs> Come on. Just get the horse. All right. Can you get on? We're safe. Joel? Joel? Shit. Joel, here. Oh, get up, get up, get up. 
You gotta tell me what to do. You gotta get up. won't last very long. You'll just startle it. I feel so bad here. Ellie's fucking scared about what will happen next. She doesn't want Joel to leave her. For one, of course she cares about him, but second, she's afraid of being alone. She will have no idea where to go or what to do next. It even had me worried, like I said before. Regardless, it's winter. We find Ellie trying to hunt for a deer, food. She finally takes it down after a way too long of a goose chase, in my opinion. When she finds the down deer, another cutscene plays. Ellie hears a ruffling sound and yells for somebody to come out while at the same time drawing her bow. A couple of average ass creepy dudes come out, come out and say that they're friendlies, but Ellie has none of it. She tells them that if they were to make any sudden moves that she'll put one right between their eyes. Fuck yes, talk yo shit, Ellie. Use that ancient blicky to your advantage. Shit, I wouldn't even be able to talk my shit if I only had a bow. Regardless, the long haired dude introduces himself as David and the Beanie Boys James. My gut feeling for these guys already is that they're trouble. They look creepy as hell. The character design on these guys is insane. David tells us that he's from a larger group that are very hungry men, women, and children. Ellie lies and says the same thing, trying to cover her tracks. David then asks if they can trade since they need the meat badly. Ellie blurts, blurts out that she needs medicine, indicating that Joel is still alive, but also giving David the info that someone is injured. Not a good move, Ellie. The suspense is building. Ellie tells David that his friend can go get the medicine while Ellie and David will stand watch over the deer so nobody takes it. And if anybody from his camp shows up other than James, Ellie will take them out. I swear Ellie acts like she's a demon from a war zone lobby, <laughs> but Ellie then jacks David's rifle and the cutscene ends. But eventually Ellie and David get into a fight with some infected that comes out of nowhere. I don't know if there was sound that the two were making, but legit an army of infected come at them, initiating a shooting gallery. After dying a shitload of times, another cutscene plays. Once again, I'll let this one play out. Listen. No infected. No infected. What'd I tell you? <laughs> All right, let's head on back. Check on that buck of ours. <sighs> well, you handled yourself pretty nice back there. <laughs> I'd say we make a pretty good team. We got lucky. Lucky? No, no. No such thing as luck. Now, you see, I believe that everything happens for a reason. Sure. Well, I do. And I can prove it to you. Now, this winter, well, it's been especially cruel. Now, a few weeks back, I uh, sent a group of men out a nearby town to look for food. Only a few came back. He said that the others had been uh, slaughtered by a crazy man. <laughs> and get this, he's a crazy man traveling with a little girl. You see, everything happens for a reason. <sighs> Don't get upset. It's not your fault. I'm just a kid. James, lower the gun. No way, David. I'm not gonna let her lower go. Lower the gun. Now give her the medicine. 
The others won't be happy about this. Yeah, well, that's not your concern. Move the fuck out of the way. You won't survive long out there. I can't protect you. Oh, thanks. Get out of here. Eventually, Ellie makes it back to her hideout along with leaving all of her tracks behind for the others to find. Come on, Ellie, you know better. Although, since it is snowing, you can't really do anything about it. You're going to leave tracks everywhere. Regardless, Ellie makes it back to Joel. He takes out the medicine that David gave her and injects the needle directly into Joel's wound, which miraculously works. I'm not sure that this is how it works, <laughs> but it is a video game. You must go along with it in order to enjoy it to its full extent. Ellie then does something cute. She lays down, puts her hand on Joel, and falls asleep. Right here is how you know Ellie cares greatly about Joel. The one gesture of her putting her hand on Joel seals it. They have grown so much throughout this game, it's so heartwarming. In the morning, Ellie wakes up to the sound of men talking, meaning that she was tracked by David's men. Fucking told you, Ellie. Regardless, she tries to escape with Callus, but the horse gets lasered, and they both fall. Ellie then runs away into the snow-covered land. After going through an intense shooting stealth gallery, Ellie gets to a door. When she tries to open it, David comes out of fucking nowhere and chokes us out, leaving Ellie unconscious and leading us to another cutscene. The scene is so creepy, I don't even know how to explain it. We found out that David and his crew were cannibals. The one fact puts Ellie in extreme amount of danger, not to mention the fact that Ellie ego challenged David and broke his finger, making David thinking that this wasn't worth keeping her around. Then all of a sudden, Joel miraculously wakes up and completely fine, which is questioning to say the least when it comes to realism, but nonetheless, we move on. After going through more enemies and massacring them, Joel takes a couple of David's men and puts them in a dark room, initiating a torture sequence. Now this one is brutal as fuck. Joel puts a knife right in the dude's thigh, takes it out, puts the knife in the dude's mouth, and makes him mark on the map where Ellie is. Fuck. This is badass and terrifying, solidifying the moral line Joel's willing to cross in order to save Ellie. Love tramples all, and Joel is willing to do whatever it takes to hold on to said love for Ellie. Joel then breaks the dude's neck, goes to the next dude, and just beats the shit out of him with a metal pipe. Oh my god. Afterwards, we go to Ellie's point of view. David drags Ellie into a table, ready to chop her up alive. Jesus, this whole section is fucked up, not pulling any punches. And right before David's about to cut her up, Ellie says that she's infected, revealing her bite. David lifts her up her sleeve and sees the bite. David freaks out, and while this happens, Ellie uses this to her advantage, but taking the cleave, taking out David's friend, and running away. I love Ellie's smarts in this scene. Although she revealed her secret of being immune, if it meant helping her escape, by all means do so. It was perfect. After going through another shooting gallery, which was quite fun, Ellie tries to open the door again, and David somehow tracks her and puts her to sleep. Then the scene cuts to Joel's point of view, looking for Ellie, going through the same shooting gallery, but then he sees the building on fire, the building that Ellie is in. Then we switch to Ellie's point of view, Oh my God, there's a lot of perspective switches, switches in the sequence. You then see Ellie try to crawl away from David, trying to get his machete that he had before. David then wakes up, taunting Ellie by kicking her down, but not trying to stop her, basically stroking his ego. Then a cutscene plays. I'm going to let this one play out because it's super important to Ellie's overall health, but also showing the love that Joel and Ellie have for each other. You can try begging. You. you think you know me? Huh? Well, let me tell you something. You have no idea what I'm capable of. Stop! Stop! Fucking touch me! Fucking, it's me! 
It's me. It's me. Look, look. It's me. He tried to... Oh, baby girl. It's okay. It's okay. No. It's okay. This brings us to spring. Now to go back and dwell on that scene before, you know, for a moment. I loved it so much to see Ellie just beat the living fuck out of David with Joel to come out and stop her is just chef's kiss. Joel holds Ellie in his arms to try to calm her down with the audio drowning out, only playing little. I thought this decision to not have the dialogue play was perfect. We didn't need it. He only needed to see the love that they have for each other. It shows Joel letting go of his pride and embracing the love he has for Ellie, calling her baby girl which is the same thing he called it Sarah. I ain't gonna lie, I teared up during this scene, but like I said, love is powerful. Joel will do anything for Ellie and vice versa. Regardless, the spring section is very emotional. You see Ellie still dwelling on winter, staring at the stag. While walking through the streets of Salt Lake City, there are so many little dialogue sequences that are perfect. Ellie's still t thinking about what happened previously. She has PTSD from what happened. You can't blame her. Eventually, Joel and Ellie come across one of the most beautiful scenes in the game, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Giraffe scene. I'll let it play. Shh, don't scare it. I won't, I won't. What are you doing? It's all right. Come here, come here. Hey, Hurry up, come on. Come on. Hey there. So fucking cool. Oh, where's it off to? Here, come on, let's go. S slow down, kiddo. <laughs> come on. Oh, man. Wow. Look at those things. So, is this everything you were hoping for? It's got its ups and downs, but you can't deny the view, though. We don't have to do this. You know that, right? What's the other option? Go back to Tommy's. Just be done with this whole damn thing. After all we've been through. Everything that I've done. It can't be for nothing. While looking at the giraffes, you can literally stand there as long as you want. I stood there for so long just reminiscing about the journey that Joel and Ellie had gone on. We came such a long way and bonded so much. It is a sight to behold and an indication that the writers did an amazing job. I've never been this invested in a game, ever. Afterwards, Joel talks to Ellie, telling her that we can leave all of this behind and just go home. Ellie pushes back and says that they've gone on this journey for so long, it can't be for nothing. They have to keep pushing forward. They could do whatever they want after this when it's over with. Then Joel says an important line. I ain't leaving without you, kiddo. Jesus, this game is going to make a grown ass man cry. But later on, Ellie then tries to talk to you with an optional dialogue pop-up. 
She says that she stole something from Jackson after talking with Maria. She pulls out the picture that Tommy tried to give to you before. Joel takes it, of course, and says that no matter how hard you try, you can't escape your past. Very true. This whole last section of the game just brings you to your feelings. I love it so much, I can't explain it. Eventually, we get to another combat section with the infected, and of course, we take them out with ease. Nothing too special about it. We then get to a section where we must cross a bunch of janky-ass cars that are in the way of flowing water. What a completely safe way to navigate. <laughs> of course, things go wrong. Joel falls, almost drowns, and then Ellie tries to save you. She gets messed up and goes unconscious underwater. And when you try to save her, a cutscene plays. I'm gonna let it play out in its entirety, considering it's a long-ass one and an important one. Hands in the air! She's not breathing. Hands in the fucking air! Come on. <laughs> Welcome to the Fireflies. Sorry about the... They didn't know who you were. And Ellie? She's all right. They brought her back. <sighs> you came all this way. How'd you do it? It was her. <clears throat> she fought like hell to get here. Maybe it was meant to be. I lost most of my crew crossing the country. I pretty much lost everything. And then you show up and somehow we find you just in time to save her. Maybe it was meant to be. You don't have to worry about her anymore. We'll take care. I worry. Just let me see her, please. You can't. She's being prepped for surgery. The hell do you mean, surgery? The doctors tell me the cordyceps, the growth inside her, has somehow mutated. It's why she's immune. Once they remove it, they'll be able to reverse engineer a vaccine. A vaccine. But it grows all over the brain. Find someone else. There is no one else. Listen, you were gonna show me where she... Stop. I get it. But whatever it is you think you're going through right now is nothing to what I have been through. I knew her since she was born. I promised your mother I would look after her. Then why are you letting this happen? Because this isn't about me. Or even her. There is no other choice here. <sighs> yeah, you keep telling yourself that bullshit. March him out of here. He tries anything, shoot him. this gift, Joe. Get up. I said get up. I said move. Give me an excuse. Which way? To 
fuck are you doing? Keep walking. I said keep walking. Where is the operating room? We see that Marlene is there. She lets us know that the only way for them to get the vaccine is to kill Ellie. Fuck no, 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 no. I ain't letting that happen and neither is Joel. The buildup in this final act is insane. Being an almost graduated film student, this is the shit they teach us. When you have a climax, you have to make it the most engaging part of the story. And this is what they did here. I also love the fact that Joel puts a gun to the dude's nuts and blows his sack off. Like, <laughs> oh my God. After this, we go through a whole section of taking out fireflies. The section was fun. You get an assault rifle, which is a weapon you didn't get throughout the whole game. Having it here was a much needed thing with it being fully automatic to help so much with the combat sequence. Regardless, we finally get to Ellie. We take out the doctors that are doing the surgery on her because we're angry as fuck. A cool detail is in the remake, the model for the main doctor connects with the sequel, Abby's dad. And I found this pretty cool. Thought it'd be cool mentioning too. Now I'm going to let this whole section play out, including gameplay. This is a part where I shouldn't talk. I need to let the emotion and weight of the scene take place. It'll explain more than I ever could. It has to do with Joel taking Ellie out of the hospital. You can't save her. Even if you get her out of here, then what? How long before she's torn to pieces by a pack of clickers? That is, if she hasn't been raped and murdered first. It ain't for you to decide. It's what she'd want. And you know it. Look. You can still the right thing here. She won't feel anything. Still wearing off. What happened? We found the fireflies. Turns out there's a whole lot more like you, Ellie. People that are immune. There's dozens, actually. I ain't done them a damn bit of good, neither. They've actually... They've stopped looking for a cure. I'm taking us home. I'm sorry.
We're finally at the end. After everything we have been through, everything that we have sacrificed, we're here. Ellie looks at her bite mark and thinks about what had just happened, thinking about if what Joel had said was true. I have no words. Truly, I don't. Ellie and Joel have some small talk along the way, talking about Sarah and how she and Ellie are alike in many ways, but eventually we get to the most important scene in the game, the end. I'm gonna let the cutscene play for the final time because you need to hear this. All right, come on. Hey, wait. <sighs> Back in Boston? Back when I was bitten? I wasn't alone. My best friend was there. And she got bit too. We didn't know what to do. So, she says, let's just wait it out. You know, we can be all poetic and just lose our minds together. I'm still waiting for my turn. Ellie. Her name was Riley and she was the first to die. And then it was Tess. And then Sam. None of that is on you. Oh, you don't understand. I struggled for a long time with surviving. And you, no matter what, you keep finding something to fight for. Now, I know that's not what you want to hear right now. Swear though, to me. Swear to me that everything that you've said about the Fireflies is true. I swear. Okay. And that's the end. The way Joel just fucking lied to her is heartbreaking, but she accepts it. She accepts that Joel either lied to protect her or lied in the name of love. She accepts that what happened had happened and she can't do anything about it. Of course, we find out what actually happened in the sequel, but nonetheless, in this game, you must accept that Joel lied. And Ellie only replied with, okay, it was a perfect ending. And although it was a cliffhanger, it was a good ass fucking cliffhanger. I couldn't help but stand up after this and clap during the credits. What did I just play? came out of my mouth after playing this for the first time in 2013, and I'm pretty sure it was the same for other people that have played the game. Wow. So to kind of make things easier for me, I'm gonna go off script here and not use a script, uh, considering I wrote 24 pages for the story. Right now I'm just gonna, I have a list in front of me and I'm gonna kind of wing it, I guess. <laughs> when it comes to the variety of enemies, there are the infected. So for the infected, your regular enemies are your runners. Then you have stalkers, which kind of hide in the shadows, don't make any sound at all. <laughs> and they come at you scaring you shitless. You have the click which kind of when they hit you once you die so you either have to use a shiv to protect yourself and you know when they come out you use it or you kill them from a distance using stealth or guns and then there is the bloater the bloater is pretty much your tank enemy you have to hit him with a whole bunch of molotovs because that's pretty much their weakness is fire or you can use your flamethrower to kill him um and then after you do that you kind of just shoot him with weapons and you pretty much kill him but that variety right there for infected is really good in gameplay um I'm I'm really glad they kind of use these different classes of infected in the game. Say like if you only did runners throughout this whole game, it would kind of make it bland and boring. You need that variety in here. When it comes to bandits, uh, you have the regular bandits, which are kind of in the Pittsburgh sequence, as well as David's men. And they kind of act the same. They pretty much swarm you, I guess. They're also in the beginning of the game with Robert's men. But from what I've found, they kind of swarm you or hit you tactically with just weapons, kind of normal human behavior. They kind of 
the same thing happens with the military, except the military has more, more modern weaponry. Uh, in the beginning, they had kind of just pistols and stuff like that, but the military also has assault rifles and stuff like that, and that carries over to the Fireflies as well. At the end, the Fireflies have assault rifles, pistols, whatever you can think of, and that's pretty much the hardest enemy in the game at the very end, but it kind of balances out because at the end of the game, you also have an assault rifle to kill them. So, and they're not too hard, but they're a nice variety when it comes to enemies, and I'm glad they had all of these factions in here. Like, say if they only had one, like, say, bandits, it would have been bland, like I said, with the infected. So that variety here really, really, really helped. And I'm glad they kind of included everything here. When it comes to the perk system, you have to pick up pills and they come in varieties of like, what was like 10, 15, 20, 25, something like that. Um, and there's a cost of certain pills when it comes to perks. So if you like look in your backpack, something will be 50, some things will be, I think even a hundred. So you have to stockpile that and determine which perk is better than most. Like there's a couple perks that include longer listening distance uh, and that sort of thing. So you really need to kind of pay attention to that. What I focused on mostly was health because if you're on harder difficulties, you're gonna find it really tough to go through sections with low health, especially the last section. I can't tell you how many times I died. So pills are very much a must and you need to look everywhere to find them. If you're on harder difficulties and things are harder to come by, it is even more important to kind of prioritize where your pills are allocated. There's also books that add to your perks that aren't really necessarily buyable. Like for one, it's like you pick up a book, you have faster reload, you have a more stockpile of shivs, you have a bigger stockpile of molotovs, bombs, stuff like that. And those are pretty much hidden throughout the game. So you need to kind of look in hard to reach places, out of the box places. There's one section when you were with Sam and Henry and I had to like look in this attic, some sort of thing. And it's not necessarily something I knew going into the remake. I actually never picked up this book before. So seeing it here after so many years was pretty cool. So out of everything, I haven't even picked up all of them. I've only picked up some, but you really need to look for these and I thought that was a good addition. I don't want to say they're necessarily puzzles to kind of look for them. You just need to think outside the box. When it comes to crafting, there's different weapons you can craft on the workbench. In the remake, they kind of revamped everything kind of what The Last of Us 2 did where you can kind of see the changes in your weapon and that sort of thing. You can get uh, reduced recoil, faster reload, more ammo capacity, and to even upgrade that, you need to find cogs around the world in these levels in order to upgrade that. So on harder difficulties, you really need to pay attention to how much you pick up and look everywhere because kind of getting those cogs and upgrading your guns becomes more important within those difficulties to even stand a chance against, against infected and other people. So do that. Also, when it comes to crafting as well, there's stuff in your backpack that you can craft. You can craft, craft shivs, you can craft bombs, molotovs, whatever it is. Um, I will say the most important thing in crafting is shivs. The reason is, is because they can get you into places that have a stockpile of like supplies. So say there's a door, you try to open it, it's locked. You'll need to open it with a shiv and you really need to be careful because sometimes you'll need that shift to when there's clickers around because clickers when they hit you you will need to press the triangle button quickly if you have a shift to not die so yeah you really need to pay attention to shivs uh but with bombs molotovs and stuff like that there should be plentiful supplies around if you're kind of in the regular easy difficulties so yeah and bombs are really fun to use you can place them wherever around the world strategically or you can just throw them at enemies which i did and it'll blow up up anything in the vicinity. Molotovs are used as kind of distractions or they can be placed as uh, kind of like a weapon. If you hit someone, everything around them is going to catch on fire. And then when they bump into other enemies, then uh, those enemies will catch on fire as well. They may not die, but at least the ones that are impacted with the Molotov itself will die. I found this crafting uh, kind of whole sequence really, really good. It's a better crafting system than most games out there. When it comes to stealth and gameplay, I really want to talk about how, about how guns work. Uh, there's like the El Diablo, the rifle, the pi different pistols, the revolver, 
There's the shotguns, the shoddy, the bow and arrow, flamethrower, assault rifle, whatever you could think of, you use them in different circumstances. With the assault rifle, you use it mostly toward the end, so you can't really upgrade it. I believe you can in New Game Plus, but I haven't tried that yet. But when it comes to like one of my favorite weapons is definitely the El Diablo because it's a it's a sniper revolver. It's really cool to use. Um, but when it terms of like running gun in this game, you really need to be careful about that because this game prioritizes stealth mostly. And when you kind of just run everywhere and shoot everything, you're more prone to die, especially on harder difficulties, especially grounded. I've played on grounded before. Fuck no. And if you're on like a speed run mode with you can't die, uh, permadeath, it becomes even more of a situation of, yeah, you need a stealth. You cannot run a gun at all. And when it comes to stealth, there's pretty much like a vision, a cone vision usually in video games. This one kind of does the same. So you really need to not let people see you. Flashlight is a huge thing. If they see you have your flashlight on, it's more of an indication that they can, you know, see you. Uh, more obviously with infected it's more lenient so for runners they can they can still see so you can use your flash you can't use your flashlight and any of those things you still need to be quiet they're kind of harder to get around but when it comes to like clickers bloaters and stalkers stalkers are a little bit kind of like runners but you need to be a lot more careful and they can be around any corner but uh, when it comes to clickers you need to be quiet it's kind of easier to navigate with clickers it's a trade-off they can kill you quickly but they can't like get you as quickly as well if that makes sense you have to really try hard for them not to see you or you actually have to like shoot them so i found it easy to get around clickers for bloaters it's kind of the same thing but most of the time when you kind of go against bloaters it's more of a a gun situation because they already see you when they get introduced like the the bus sequence for character interactions i'm kind of gonna go over this quickly because i kind of went over it mostly within the story section i know i said i'd dabble more into afterwards but overlooking everything i really did cover it in my story section but the triangles over the head for dialogue sequences and when you press that like optional dialogue will play kind of getting you closer to ellie tess bill whoever it is and i really prioritize you like pressing that triangle button because when you press that you get more in depth of their background and stuff like that like for one in the spring section when you press triangle there's like a sequence where you talk about how ellie had a dream with a plane and that stuff is like very minor in story purposes, but it adds greatly when it comes to getting closer to characters. This game is very much prioritizing character over like set pieces and that sort of thing. So I, you really need to press those triangle buttons and get to know more about characters. And I loved it here. I love the optional dialogue sequences. When you when you implement that into a game, like I've said previously, you want to keep pressing it, pressing it, or you wanna look and see if it's even there because you get attached to these characters so frequently and uh, so often that you just want to keep doing it. There's also character awareness with those interactions as well. Like again, I'm going to use the spring section as a kind of base point of this. When you see Ellie is sad and you try to get a ladder to kind of go up places, you will see that she is kind of dozing off and you kind of have to get her attention because you've been like so used to getting the ladder. Uh, you have to lift Ellie up to even get the ladder, push it down, stuff like that. You're so used to that. But when you see Ellie not do it and she is so focused on what happened in the winter section, that's what I call character awareness. Like these characters are hurting. They're thinking about something for her. She has PTSD. So of course they're not going to do what they're, they've been doing for the rest of the game because they have emotion. They're going to show that. And in this game, they just do it so well. And I've never seen a game ever do this. And I just love it so much. So now we're at the end of the video. The Last of Us is a brilliant game with brilliant characters. Joel, Ellie, Tess, Sam, Henry. Literally every character in this game has depth and care given towards them. This game was very much a journey game, meaning this game doesn't necessarily focus on the plot itself, but the journey that takes place in order to get to the climax of the plot. Playing this game in 2013, I was appalled by how much depth and care was given to this game, and I still think that now. No other game that I've played is like this. Even when playing the remake with built from the ground up visuals, I still feel the same. Only a handful of games made me feel this way, and let me tell you, I am extremely hard on games when it comes to narrative. This game actually gave me a new outlook on life. Love is above all other emotions. You will do literally everything in the name of love. The father-daughter bond that Joel and Ellie had changed me, and I don't even have a child. I still cried to this game when it first came out. 
even now. I'm just so happy that this game even came out. It is no coincidence that this game has won tons of Game of the Year awards. So without further ado, let's get to the ranking. To go over everything, the lowest of the totem pole is not even close. This means that the game was nowhere near a masterpiece and there's a lot more work to be done. Next is it has potential, meaning this game has a chance to be good with some updates and maybe build off of it to make a sequel. The next highest is amazing. This means that the game is great, but because of some bugs or some story hiccups, it isn't quite a masterpiece. Lastly, masterpiece. This means the game is generation defining, solidifying itself as one of the greatest games of all time, sealing itself into the gaming hall of fame. So what do I rank this game? What's even a question? It's a masterpiece. This game is one of the greatest ever made, maybe even the greatest game of all time. I know to me it is, it's one of my favorites. It is my favorite. Once again, thank you to everyone who has been watching these critiques. It means so much to me and I can't wait to do more. I will say the next video will be about the new God of War coming out, so keep a lookout. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe, comment, whatever you need to do. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.